Well, thank you um, for having me here. And, and I'm just, I'm, I think it's, I, you know, I looked at the questions, um, Leaf, that you circulated beforehand, and I, I just thought that they were a very, very good uh, set of questions for us to talk about, not in a sort of get the wheels started kind of way, oh, let's, you know, give it the old college try, but actually very meaningful, penetrating questions. So I'm, I'm happy to go through and talk about some of those uh, things as a group. But I think the first thing I just, and, and obviously, if we go sideways, we go sideways. But I think one of the um, one of the points that I, I think I want to make right away, right, is, is is what's my claim to authority, right? Well, how, on, on what basis um, do I have something to say about you know this election or this situation, which would be you know more authoritative or worth listening to than whatever any other intelligent or contemplative person would have to say about it, right? Because I'm not a policy, I'm not a political scientist, okay? Like many law students, I minored in political science. And I'm, I'm not, a, and, I, and, and my evidence and my uh, research is largely theoretical and on the kind of borderline between political and legal theory. So I certainly don't do empirical work. I don't do statistical analysis. I don't look at polling data, right? So if you're looking for expert opinion on polling data, um, you're not going to get that from me. You'll get, you know, a, a rational person who knows how to think about and read polls and can talk about them. But where I'm expert is uh, I'm expert on what the rule of law and what that means, okay? And the intersection between um, the rule of law and democracy and particularly, especially as understood in the concept of constitutionalism. And I'm expert in that as a kind of theoretical idea uh, with a particular intellectual history in the uh, Anglo-American tradition, also in the continental tradition. Those are things that I've studied and looked at. I've thought a lot about the concept of, uh, of, of sovereignty, constituent power, about the nature of the state and the social contract, uh, particularly through the prism of constitutionalism. The other thing that I've, I've, I've looked at in my own research and in my own kind of um, development as a, as a scholar is, is, the, um, is actually the absence of the question of culture in where we talk about law or politics, for example, right? So, so what started to interest me personally was when I graduated from law school, I went to law school at McGill. So I did a, a mixed common and civil law degree. Um, and then I graduated and I went to work in a big firm in New York. And then after I worked there for a couple of years uh, and I was admitted as a lawyer, I went to the UK to do my graduate studies, right? And so I, what I, and so I studied and worked in three different English speaking um, common law jurisdictions and three different English speaking cultures, which were very accessible to me as a native English speaker. And even in the case of the UK and the US, as a Canadian, you have some already exposure to those cultures, all right? So what started to fascinate me was this question of what's distinguishing between our culture? Like, what is it about our legal culture? Is it so, why, how different are we? How similar are we? You know what I mean? And what are, and, and what are some tendencies that we share and don't share and what are those explained? And part of them is about legal culture, right? And so I think that there's, a, there's an aspect of the Canadian experience experience, which is, is necessarily a kind of interest in what's happening in the United States, right? And it's an odd relationship because sometimes you have to justify that interest, right? Because the question is, well, well, why are you even interested in that? We have our own country. So then you have to think about why you're interested in it, right? Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's ever present because our cultural is dominated by our cultural landscape, our media milieu, everything is dominated by the American perspective, right? So there's that. So and and but Jen, but there's also this idea that the Canadians have that always fascinated me too was this a little bit of an idea that you know whatever the excesses of the Americans are that's not about us. We're a much more civilized version. You know, like we didn't have slavery. Eh, not true. We did. You know what I mean? Like we didn't you know exploit and kill our indigenous people. Uh, we did. You know what I mean? Like we are not. And in fact, if you go back into Canadian history, what you realize is where Americans and Canadians diverged around the question of republicanism or loyalism, we were pretty uncool, conservative and stuffy, and they were actually trying something radical and different. So we have to be honest about these things and not have a revisionist view of our history. Oh, we're better. We're not these right wing zealots that the Americans are. Our history is one of peace. You know what I mean? And, and that that is a, it's not helpful. Right. And so. A lot of the stuff about why are we interested in America? What's the relationship between America and Canada? How has America influenced Canada? And you can see, you know, the enormity of, of America's influence on Canada. There's no question that America is hugely influenced on Canada, including modern and constitutional institutions, right? Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which came to us in 1982, 
right, came to us through, an, through a generation of lawyers and politicians who admired the Warren Court and the Burger Court in the United States and the American Constitution because that was a liberal court. And that was a liberal reading of the Constitution. And they said, we need a Bill of Rights that guarantees people rights in Canada. It was, oh, no, 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 that's going to Americanize us. We can't do that, right? But we did do that. And we became a lot less like the UK because we got a written Constitution, which is a feature of a Republican style thing, a government. So we have Republican features, but we're still this constitutional monarchy. So we're in between all of this, right? But there's just an enormous amount of melange in our political and legal culture. And most of all, though, the fascination or the interest in America is, is, is by necessity because of the America's sort of influence on our, our reality, as well as the fact that, you know, America shapes, um, you know, we share, the culture is so deeply shared around, you know, ideas of the rule of law, democracy, sovereignty, human rights, all those things that in America is, is such a vast and imperial power that, you know, of course we're interested. And of course, it has an impact on us. So there should be no feeling that we're indulging like a hobby horse by talking about this. And when I say, you know, why do I talk about this? Am I, am I an expert in American history? No, I'm a, I'm a very educated layperson around that. But what I'm expert around is the, the theory and um, ideas of constitutionalism, the rule of law, democracy, how they intersect around that explosive fault line between law and politics. And I, I understand that from this, from the perspective, a little bit of constitutional culture, if you will, in a couple different jurisdictions, particularly the US and Canada. And so it's through that prism that I think it's interesting to talk about questions about Donald Trump. But I also, I'm teaching a course in my, to my upper year students and it's called Rule of Law in the 21st Century, right? And what this course is about is it's about thinking about what happened to the rule of law in the 21st century, because when I was in law school, my first year of law school was 2000, right? So that was Bush v. Gore. And then the second year was the events of 9-11. That shaped everything about how I became a lawyer, how I became a citizen, how I grew up as an adult, right? So for all of you, you're not necessarily studying law, but whatever you're studying, your formative years are now in the midst of COVID. They're in the midst of Donald Trump. And all these questions are transnational. They're not purely in one country or another. So they're going to shape who you are and how you think about things. But one thing that was apparent to me was from, from, two, from 2001 until the end of the Bush presidency in 2008, and then again from 2016 until the present, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a significant move in the United States and in many other countries in the world to move away from what had hitherto been uh, recognized norms around uh, human rights and uh, you know, uh, right conduct of statecraft and state affairs and, and, and increasing questions about the limits of the rule of law. And then you had this kind of period in America where you had the Obama presidency for eight years where things in some ways appeared to return to normal, but certain structural changes remained. And some structural changes were made in Canada as well in the Harper era, which remained with us and also in the UK in different ways. Again, I don't wanna to get too waylaid into that, but there's something about the 21st century that hasn't been a kind of um, progressive arc towards you know, ever greater progress in perfecting the rule of law formula and like what is the rule of law formula of course you could ask but one of the things that the rule of law formula is if, that we could all agree or most people can agree on is that the law binds everyone the leaders and the led the, the people and the sovereign right so that everybody is bound by the same laws that's the essence of the rule of laws whether you think that should be just formal laws or has more substantive meaning etc cetera, etc cetera. what's the problem with the rule of law Here's the problem with the rule of law. People do not understand that the rule of law is not the same as democracy. The rule of law is a constraint on democracy, right? Because democracy means rule by mob. And the only way to protect the minority is to have the rule of law, right? And so what we see in the Trumpian era, in what we see in many other countries that are reproducing this kind of rationality and this kind of authoritarian politics is this idea that this is the will of the people. This is the democratic arm. The judiciary isn't elected. And the rule of law ought to give way to democratic populism. So we now, and nobody has been prepared for having that debate or articulating an art, a sensible argument in the context of being asked to choose between the concept of the rule of law and democracy. So that is what brings me in particular, as well as just the shock of, I should say, the, the, the fact of rising authoritarianism it, for all of us is something that we have, we have to be able to explain to our kids what we did, right? So for me, it's like, what am I gonna, am I gonna tell my kids what did I do? during this time, right? So that's what brings me to, to, to be with you today and to think that maybe, you know, that's where I would have some authority to speak about these issues. So I'm sure there's some things that you've come across in your studies or some ideas that I've not been 
exposed to that, that may, you know, um, you know, I could learn from it. So there's an enormous amount of knowledge um, out there and different people have different knowledge about different things, but that, that's sort of where I come from in terms of my expertise. So I think that's been already a long enough introduction for me. No, that's been great, Jeffrey. And that's awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess before, it, does anyone sort of have anything that they, you know, wanted based on that, wanted to sort of start us off and, and ask Jeffrey about or, or comment around that? I could move into the questions, but maybe I'll just open up the floor briefly first, if that's, you know. Okay, well, why don't we start with the obvious topic? Let's start talking a little bit about mm -hmm. COVID, you know? That's, uh, that seems like the, the overwhelming thing that everyone's been talking about in 2020. Um, the first thing sort of we, we wanted to chat about that we had noted here was around, um, you know, the, the, the impact of the pandemic around specifically campaign mm -hmm. strategies and, and that kind of thing. Um, oh, I think we have one more person joining us here. I'll just welcome Gurdeep if you can, if you can hear us. You're welcome to join the discussion here. Um, yeah, do you want, Jeffrey, do you want to start us off and maybe talk a little bit about some of the sort of major impacts you see from this sort of this pandemic on the election and what ways has it been maybe a typical election or what ways has it been Well, unusual? you can speculate, guess, you can speculate about the effect of COVID on the election, right? So what historians and political scientists and journalists and everybody, probably including me, is going to think about is, you know, was it, is it the case that the outbreak of a global pandemic, which was most hard hit in the United States and ended up being this kind of fault line along which uh, the kind of pol the polarized politics of America sort of played out, that that was not anticipated, right? And so what would Donald Trump have, you know, had a, an easier road to re-election? We still don't know what's going to happen, as all of you said, we can get into that, but would he have an easier road? Would he be in the kind of desperate last minute position he's in? I mean, maybe not, maybe so. It's hard to say that he, he was remarkably, I mean, the thing about Donald Trump that one has to remember is that he's always, he's never had the majority of Americans supporting him. I mean, his polling numbers have always been sort of remarkably steady in the mid to high 40s nationally, right? And so what Donald Trump was able to do in the same way, frankly, that uh, George W. Bush did in 2000 was despite not having the popular vote, able to use the, the electoral college, which as you know, those of you who studied US history will know, was designed to represent geographical and other interests beyond pure majoritarianism in the American system, because the American system is characterized by Republican ideas and liberal ideas and different ideas which accentuate or de-accentuate um, popular democracy and have other forms of representation. So what though I think the the, the reason the Trump campaign in 2016 was quite significant, and maybe if it hadn't been for COVID, who knows, but it was significant because the Republicans, and this is, this is definitely true also of Mitch McConnell, who's a, who's, whose role as the Speaker of the, of the Senate is, is very, very important in all this. He's a much shrewder tactician than is Donald Trump, right? But these guys understood that when, in 2008, it was very clear that the reason Barack Obama, it was possible for an African-American man, particularly, it's not just any African-American man, it was a particular African-American man, and that was, Don, that was Barack Obama, to become president of the United States was partially a product of demographics, right? That um, many of the states which had previously been hard Republican states uh, were seen to be, you know, red states were becoming purple. And the reason that they were becoming purple was because their, their populations were skewing younger. And particularly in many states who are more um, Spanish speaking, uh, uh, Hispanic voters. And, um, and, and of course, Barack Obama unleashed the full sort of potentiality of the young African-American vote, which is a significant voting bloc, which, you know, typically supported Democrats, but brought them out in a larger number. Younger demographics, more Spanish speaking people, more people coming in to be first time voters. Those were all things over the long term, which militated in favor of increasing um, wins for Democrats at the presidency and increasing control of the other branches of government. The Republicans knew that, and they knew that there's nothing that they could do with the, it, there's nothing that they could do to change that. There was no way they could change the fact that America was getting younger, more diverse, more educated, more cosmopolitan, and that ultimately the average American was neither white nor black, but had skin tone somewhere in between. That was not something the Republicans could do. So what they had to do is they had to figure out how to hijack the institutions of democracy in order to make sure that they would have as long a run as possible. 
And that's what we're seeing playing out right now. And the Democrats were always sort of acted as though they were gentlemanly and in good faith. And they were kind of, they hearkened back to an earlier era, this imagined halcyon day of bipartisanship, right? And the thing that's a bit like cringe inducing about Joe Biden is that he continues to sort of use that rhetoric. And, and maybe that is part of what he needs to do to thread the needle to win. But playing by the rules has been disastrous for Democrats and the Republicans have clearly been willing to throw them out. So being honorable and playing by the rules when they're broken really hasn't working. And so it works. So what it's led to is a situation that we have now, right, which is you have a Republican um, Congress knowing that they're going to get probably pounded in the election. They may well lose the White House and they're going to jam their extreme, extreme uh, ideological person into the Supreme Court. And now you see three judges appointed by Donald Trump, all of who are so outside uh, the mainstream of, uh, of, you know, typically what most Americans, let alone most lawyers would believe, who have, you know, sort of very mar- made very clear both in extemporaneous comments, but also in a re- recent judgment about uh, in Wisconsin, which we can get into if you want, that they're going to read this, ve- they're going to take any dispute very, very narrowly, right? And this is not a surprise, because this is what happened in 2000. Ultimately, this was decided along partisan lines. And Al Gore said, in the interest of stability, and the rule of law, I'm going to accept this outcome, right? Democrats always play nice, right? And so now here we are, and the, and the Republican court has signaled it's been it's been stacked. Remember when Obama was president? Uh, in the last year or two of his of his uh, administration, Mitch McConnell wouldn't confirm any of his judges. He just would not confirm them. So what happened is when put when 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 Trump came in, there were a dearth of spaces in the judiciary, and this isn't just at the high court. This is all levels of the federal court jam in all the most right-wing candidates, right? And it, and so that means now Trump has appointed more, more judges, not only to the Supreme Court, three, but more to all the courts than any one-term president except Jimmy Carter, right? And so he's had a huge lasting impact now. So the question is, of course, do we expand the court? Do the Democrats come in? Do they use their power to expand the court? And they can do that. The, Republic, the Constitution does not prevent that from happening. And now that they've played nice all these years and here they are, you know, uh, it may well be a reasonable approach to, in fact, the Democrats want to and win, and they truly want to undo the damage that's been done by, you know, this authoritarian presidency, they will have to do radical things like ending the filibuster, uh, increasing the size of the Supreme Court. Um, and and I believe actually that there is support for that among the majority of Americans. I think many Americans are more progressive and they want bigger change than is necessarily acknowledged by the kind of centrist media and the corporate world, and even by you know Barack Obama, by sorry, by Joe Biden and those closest to him. So I think it's possible, but they have to have the will to do it, and they may not. So it's not clear. There's no way to predict exactly what the future is going to hold either way. Um, but this is yeah, where we are. If I, take, yeah. if I can take you up on that point there, that a lot of Americans actually want more progressive policies. Yeah. And what you said earlier about how the Republicans that they've pretty much acknowledge that they don't actually win elections by popular support. I think the way in which COVID has then kind of changed election strategies for Republicans in particular is by creating an issue in which they can wedge people and kind of divide and conquer people. And so it's not so much a response to their policies, but rather just either agreeing or disagreeing with how COVID is being handled by them. I think though where you see the major kind of benefit of actually or who's really benefiting from COVID though is Joe Biden who's essentially been able to not say anything for the last handful of months and just kind of hide in the shadows. I think the consequence of that is that the kind of progressive wing that did start to emerge in the Democratic Party kind of with Bernie Sanders and whatnot they've really not been able to challenge the the kind of more establishment aspects of the Democratic Party that Joe Biden represents. And then kind of just to take you to the very end of that, I think one of the things that I've really noticed from the handful of debates is the total absence of any kind of environmental policies by that of the Democrats. And I think both in the the vice presidential debate and in the last debate, I think both Democratic candidates were cowed into basically arguing how they were going to support fracking um, rather than do a Green New Deal or something along those lines. And I think where, like, I, I, I've heard in people talk about changing the court, changing the number of people on the court, putting um, caps on how long they can serve for. And I think those ideas are all, should be explored for sure. But the thing that I kind of see that wasn't talked about with the Amy Cohen Barrett um, nomination was the way in which she was going to treat workers 
and the way in which she viewed environmental um, rights and environmental mm. legislation. Mm, mm. In that sense, I don't, I, I, I just question how much of a change Democrat or like just loading more people that Joe Biden would support onto that court might actually change things in the long run. Because so I guess right. just to wrap up my kind of point here, like I, there's definitely major differences in between Joe Biden and Donald Trump and the way they treat people and the way they run things on a day-to-day -day basis. But there isn't that big of a difference in the way in which they view, I think like corporations, corporate power and corporate power's ability to do things that are ultimately gonna destroy the world, like polluting um, and creating more arms and inciting more wars over oil and gas. There's a lot of great value in there that I want to respond to, but I'm not sure anybody else uh, wants to say anything. I, I've got you've given me a lot to think to, to respond to there, but I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything before I respond. I'll just say on the COVID thing, I, again, thank you for bringing me back to that because I think the, the, the wild card, the way in which COVID plays a wild card is, is sort of, it's really the question of how far people are willing to push these beliefs, right? Like, and so this is, so this is where the die, this is where, you know, the people who like um, Stephen Hassan, who's, a, who's a, a behavioral psychologist and a PhD in the US says that Donald Trump is a death Trump, is a death cult, right? So that MAGA is a death cult. And so these people are not like the followers, unlike the followers of Charles Manson or David Koresh <clears throat> or whomever else. So that if Donald Trump says, listen, on with it, we're going to get your immunity, take off your mask, come to my rally. That's what suicide death cults do. So looking at the dump Trump presidency through the prism of U normal U.S. politics or electoral politics, not going to get you far enough understanding what the hell's going on. Better to look at it through the prism of a death cult. So that became apparent to me. There's something to that philosophy when it when when there was these diehard Trump supporters who sort of came out and it was actually leaning into the resistance to the public health message around masking. That was a big thing. Now, some of the things that you're, and so again, whether that will lead people to say, okay, that's what bridge too far or whether that, you know, what, it, either way, we don't know, but it's something, right? Some of the other points that you made through, I was taking, I wanted to make notes on. I, I, wanna, I wanna tell you one thing, you talked about uh, Amy Comey Barrett and the environment, right? The, the remember that, uh, and, and for all her foibles, you know, and I agree with you, I'm not, I'm, I'm a social Democrat. I'm not a, I'm not a sort of centrist neolib, right? And I think that that's what Biden and Harris are. I do, however, think there's a big difference between some of these centrist neolibs and the conservative uh, and these ultra right wing authoritarians. And I think that our art period right now, so what I tell my class, this is a lot like the 1930s. It's not a time for liberals who believe in the status quo and social Democrats to start sniping at each other. We've got a common enemy right now. That's authoritarianism. And we can take an issue with technocratic liberalism and its sort of abeyance to capitalism and environmental destruction once we rid ourselves of somebody who's attempting to tear down everything good about our traditions and create cynicism and anger between citizens right so to me it's like we're in a civil war right now but it's it's that whatever internal differences exist between social democrats and liberals have to be united here now specifically though on the politics of the left right i think is a bit of a misnomer out there first let's understand that actually it's particularly, it's a group called the Sunshine Coalition in the United States, which is the main group, which has been sort of active on the issue of the Green New Deal, working with progressive members of Congress and also working with people like Elizabeth Warren and, Bar and Bernie Sanders on the left side of the Senate and in that presidential race. They came, to, they knew that they knew that, that they were part of the reason and not all the reason, the main reason that Hillary Clinton lost the election last time is having illusions, it's just pure misogyny, right? But one of the other reasons was because um, the, the real, the left didn't really full-throatedly endorse her because of these, uh, this feeling that she's a mealy mouth centrist candidate and what the hell is the difference? We now know what the difference is, right? But now the Sunshine Coalition is not stupid and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are not stupid. They actually engaged in substantive negotiations with Biden about his platform. His platform is far to the left of what his personal politics are. They made significant headway. And although his platform isn't what is being called the Green New Deal and is associated with the original deal that uh, uh, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, unveiled with Bernie Sanders, it's much, much closer to that than any of the kind of environmental policies that were that were put forward by the Obama-Biden administration in the past. You know, universal health care, um, you know, not quite there yet, but a much more progressive package than had been seen in the past. And I think and in the interviews I've seen with Joe Biden, 
it, to me, it's clear that he understands that one of the mistakes that the Obama administration did actually was trying to be too centrist, trying to be all things to everyone. So I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I, I think it, and if he came became president, he would immediately have to offer the Treasury Secretary to Elizabeth Warren and the Labor Secretary to Bernie Sanders to signal that this was going to be a very serious, inclusive cabinet in which progressive ideas were there. But yeah, he's not a total progressive. He's, he's kind of centrist. But I think the differences are there. And I think progressives have done a decent job of influencing his platform. Now, specifically to this question of the debates and, and what happened there, and also the question of Amy Comey Barrett on their environment. First, let me say on the question of Amy Coney Barrett on the environment. Kamala Park, Kamala Harris is, you know, again, she's she's no radical, right? She's not, she's a latecomer to Black Lives Matter, fine. But she's, and she's a prosecutor, but she's a very good lawyer. She's very good at cross-examining. Most other members of Congress, are, they're terrible lawyers. They've been sitting in Congress their entire life. They have no idea how to cross-examine someone. Not that I do, I'm an academic, but at least I don't pretend, right? But they do, they, and so there are just these stupid monologues, right? But she said to, said to uh, it, she had this exchange, and you can find it online, um, and I, I just trying to remember, I, I always forget what the exact examples were that she used in the, in the, in the, in the first one, but she, she asked, cause judges can take judicial notice of facts, right? And so when a judge takes a judicial notice of a fact, that means you don't have to introduce evidence to prove it, right? It is colder in January in Kamloops than it is in Vancouver. You don't have to adduce uh, evidence to have a court take notice of that. So what uh, Kamala Harris, uh, asked, um, you know, Amy Comey bears a series of questions, including one, do you believe that COVID is a real thing? Yes. Do you think it's transmissible? Yes. Uh, and then she said, um, can you acknowledge that the, the global climate is changing and it's as a result of you know, human causes? And she said, no, I cannot take a position on that because that's a controversial issue upon which I might be called upon to, to rule. And I said, this is totally disqualifying. The evidence is so overwhelming of a human made climate change to not take judicial notice of it suggests, well, I don't know what else you're not going to take judicial notice of, you know, that slavery ever existed or that, um, you know, anything, because this is clearly somebody who's willing to play fast and loose with the facts. Supreme Court of the United States, one week later, Brett Kavanaugh, appointed by President Trump, is ruling on this decision in, in Wisconsin. And he says, I don't, it, Wisconsin saying, what do we do with postmark ballots? that come in after the election, we want to, and he says, don't count any, any postmark ballots after the election. You, you have to cut it off right then because we need certainty. That's what Donald Trump said. And also said, there's too much risk of fraud with vote and mailing either. We, you know, we don't want that fraud percolating out there. There's been no evidence of fraud, none, no evidence of risk, no reason a ballot is postmarked that it can't be bad after. So Brett Kavanaugh signaled he too is not interested in the world of facts or taking judicial notice of reality. He's interested in a particular worldview, regardless of whether there's any factual basis. So for judges to recognize and take that view is very alarming. In her dissenting uh, decision, Justice Elena Kagan said, because it, it, at reacting to the words of Justice Kavanaugh, where he says, we don't want the election results to come in and then the, the count afterwards to flip it in the days after. She said, there's no flipping because the results aren't in until all the ballots are counted. So you've got now at least two justices with this view. Again, John Roberts, a different story, but I know John Roberts, uh, um, Justice uh, Brett Kavanaugh and um, um, Amy Comey Bear all worked on the Bush team, legal team in the Bush v. Gore recount in 2000. They're experts in this area of law. They have very definitive opinions around it. This is a, a problem. It's a very serious problem. So, um, but again, on the environment, she was asked about it very effectively by Kamala Harris, and she just made this remark, which again, I think was disqualifying. A couple of the other notes that you made um, uh, on the question of, um, um, again, the challenges from the left of this, I, I think maybe we'll have to see what happens after the election, but I think they did everything they could to position themselves, and then the platform is not bad. Again, there's no Republican platform, right? There's no, the Trump platform is just CR 2016 platform. They don't even have a platform. The Democratic platform is the best Democratic platform in the history of the party, much more progressive than Hillary's platform or Obama's platform. So it's OK. I'm OK. We'll see what happens after. Right. But of course, they take corporate money. They're centrist. They have to revise their past history of sort of tough talk on law and order and, you know, deficit hawk kind of bullshit. And yeah, right. But they recognize, I think, to some extent, the times are changing a bit. So I think, you know, I think probably Biden would rather be remembered as an FDR than a, than a Carter if he gets elected. So I'm not sure that, you know, let's be hopeful. 
that the other thing you want to talk about though is the fracking question that's a very specific thing about fracking and you're like what the hell i, I remember i watched them like why are these guys i saw that in the debate the vice presidential debate and the um vice presidential debate why the hell are uh is kamala harris and joe biden wasting all this political capital looking into the camera and telling america we're not against fracking it's like everyone no one wants fracking fracking's fucked and if you like it just take a stand and be principled what the hell's wrong with you um, but let me put it out to you. There's a, there's a reason for this. Yeah. And there's a reason that they were inconsistent with past statements. This is a very clear reason. It's not very, um, uh, anyway, do you know what it is? Well, it's a signal to the corporate donors. It's a signal to the oil and gas corporations and to the kind of whole infrastructure that maintains U.S. geopolitical power. Uh, sports, but I mean, maybe there's some of that. I, I can't say that's not true, but there's something much more specific that we're looking at here. Okay. I'd be interested to hear your take. Yeah. Anybody else? Where does fracking happen in America? In, in key election states as well, yeah. Which state specifically? Which part of Pennsylvania? Western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Western Pennsylvania. If you can't drive up the Philadelphia uh, um, African-American progressives, and there's all kinds of reasons to believe that we can, you can't, they, they feel that their campaign is made in a very calculated risk that, you know, some of the lunch bucket, you know, white conservatives, you know, who would, would, would stay home or vote for Trump on that issue alone. So they're not taking the risk. Now, I've heard some political um, analysts from Pennsylvania say that's totally overblown. Fracking is already dead. People are getting their money elsewhere. It's done more destruction than not. So they lack the political courage. And so if I was the advisor, I'd be like, tell them screw fracking, let Pennsylvania twist. But they're not taking that chance, and that's why they're doing it. Whether this government, but he, but Joe Biden has said, and he said in the last election that he was going to phase out fossil fuels, right? And that's what. Remember, Donald Trump's, ooh, ooh, that's a big one. Oh, Joe Biden, I got you now, right? But that is what we should expect them to be saying, and then we should hold them to that. Yeah, that's kind of what I think too. And just like as you said earlier, most Americans actually want more progressive um, environmental legislation, in particular and better working rights in particular. And I think a move away from oil and gas in general is a way of kind of showing a dedication to both of those things in general. And by flip-flopping on, on that, I think what it really does open up is just that kind of question of the corporate association that the Democrats have been- Cynicism. For, for a long time. And young people and left people, like 19, 20 year old kids, 30, 20, 21 year old kids, like you guys, 22, 23 college students are gonna be like, oh, fuck these two white guys, forget it. I'm not going out. We can't have that, right? So. But I, in my view, is I'm with you guys in the sense that I feel your generation and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a progressive, right? So I'm like, man, you give the young people a reason to come out. Screw the dad who like has some kind of mixed emotions about this in some central Pennsylvania writing. But the truth of the matter is, is every I had thought and many others on the left had said Biden is the wrong candidate in this election. Uh, Kamala Harris is the wrong vice president. We needed to go. We needed to have a strong left progressive person. And that, you know, so far, we don't know what the answer to this question is, right? There was an equally strongly held view among the Biden type people that that was a big mistake and that the dad, the middle-aged dads, moms and dads, who they actually need these little white good citizen people to come out and vote, they wouldn't necessarily come out for somebody. They were vulnerable to having somebody smeared as a radical and the Trump people, they're for sure going to come out, right? So there's a lot of nervousness. I don't know who was right or wrong. But there's aspects of the platform here which are good. But we should probably get off this and start talking about some yeah. of the other stuff. Yeah. No, yeah, I think that's great. Um, I mean, I did actually have one question about one thing you said there, Jeffrey, just around the expansion of the Supreme Court, because I've been thinking about that a, a fair bit. And, oh, am I cutting out? Yeah, I think it's still kind of true. Um, no. Is that, is that something that... Um, I guess when I think about it, it seems like this, this representative thing of like changing sort of these longstanding, I guess, like institutions that exist in the United States. And I, I hear what you're saying in terms of maybe the fears around saying, if we just don't change anything with the Supreme Court, there will be all sorts of damage in all sorts of areas due to positions on climate change, on things like counting and mail-in ballots for future elections and things like that. But I guess on the flip side, like, is, is there sort of, I guess, like a slippery slope there in terms of saying, if we start changing some of these like long held institutions in terms of the number of, you know, Supreme Court justices and things like this, you know, next time around, if you, you have a, the next sort of Republican person in there, 
does that put more things on the table and almost lead us to sort of a, a faster decline in a sense as well? You know, it, I, I guess it, it seems hard to me when I look at it because it doesn't feel like there's an easy or a right answer there in terms of like what you do around an institution like that. Well, I mean, uh, again, I mean, part of the thing you have to realize about constitutions is that constitutions can be amended. For starters, the constitution does nothing to prohibit an expansion of the court, but the constitution can be amended to do all kinds of things to reform and better the republic. It has been done many times in the past. So first you have to call out the hypocrisy of Republicans who say, we can't do this because we worship the constitution. Well, the worst, the constitution can be changed. I mean, a hundred years from now, eventually you'll repeal the second amendment. It's just a matter, America will mature eventually. It's gonna take a long ass time, right? So when you talk about things like the Supreme Court, I think Democrats have, and including very strong institutionalists like Joe Biden, like Barack Obama, like Nancy Pelosi, it's not so much because they're beholden to particular power interests as much as it is that they're big institutionalists, they're big, big believers in the institutions. The, the Republicans, re, they abuse the institutions and the Democrats say, we're going to act according to our principles, we're not going to abuse the principles. So we don't want that race to the bottom. So no, we're very nervous about saying we're going to play around with the number of seats on the court, right? We don't want to do that. We don't want to play with the filibuster. What if we need that later when you know we're in the minority or whatever? But this is not working. And Americans' institutions are, 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 are the, America's at the brink of potential civil war because its institutions can't handle the pressure of the current moment. So the institutions have to be reformed. The constitution may have to be amended in a variety of ways. New laws have to be adopted. And new norms have to be brought to bear and they have to be argued for so that there will be significant buy-in. But if, let me tell you something, this is this is a big problem for the incoming, if the Democrats win control of, uh, uh, of the Senate, maintain control of the House of Representatives and get the White House, and this court is left as it is, every single major program, every single major piece of legislation that they're able to pass will come slamming into a halt in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court will thwart, it will thwart the mandate that that uh, Congress and the president has been given, period. That's what they're there to do. So the, long, the, the longer we pretend that there's anything else other than the case and play around about being decorous, the more the more it'll be government by like destruction and nihilism. I and mean, you already already almost saw that in the Obama administration, how hard it was to get anything done and how the Trump administration, basically all it's done was single mindedly focus on deconstructing whatever the prior administration did. You know, in this environment, I don't see a lot of choice. You know, and I think the one thing we haven't discussed, which is really important too, is is the importance that because that state houses also um, move over to the Democratic column because it's the state houses which draw the jurisdictional borders, right, and which allow congressional districts to draw out African American people, draw out poor people, and make sure that they stay Republican forever. And Democrats have always been focused on presidential and the Senate races. They tend not to like the little local stuff. But they've really got to focus on that, too. And that's what Eric Holder and Barack Obama understood and they've been doing over the last few years. And that, that is important work. Maybe let's move into this sort of fairness, security election area. Sure. Um, we, ca- we kind of touched on it a little. And I, and I know, Jeffrey, you talked about saying basically, you know, fraud is not an issue. It's, it's not something that's happening sort of like, you know, that's the, the actual truth. There is no evidence of it. Well, voter but intimidation happens. That's what I was going to say. There's the other side of it, which is sort of the, the voter suppression, voter intimidation, yeah. you know, lack of access to 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 voting in, in yeah. that sense, right? Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess, like, do people see that as being sort of a significant force coming out of this election? You know, are we going to be see, sitting here two weeks from now going, you know, this is a big part of the reason why we're seeing, seeing the outcome we are, that kind of thing. Well, in 2000, the Bush campaign famously sent its, Brook, its Brooks Brothers Army as the um, as the observers at the poll, right? So all these guys came down to Florida with these pinstripe suits from New York. Oh, very intimidating! All these bankers and lawyers from New York. Ooh. This time, the president has called upon militia groups to come out and present themselves at the poll and to watch very closely what's happening. So it's a given that there's going to be, and that is voter intimidation. Um, and so, okay, well. First, the thing is, I think here, first you have to say is this is the thing that the, the claim that there's that there's voter fraud is the basis for voter intimidation, right? But the problem is there's no voter fraud or such limited de minimis amounts historically. Um, and this is, by the way, altogether separate from questions of hacking or electronic interference by malign forces, foreign or domestic. This is just a question of whether voters themselves are acting fraudulently. And the effort to suppress voters is, you know, it's one that's consistent with Jim Crow laws in America's past, but in this specifically in the contemporary context, it's very much a part of the same question, which I said before, which is the state's control the voting. It's not a federal elections commission, right? 
And so if the states are Republican and they have a Republican secretary of state who's the chief electoral officer, they can set the rules, right? Which are, which are say, you know, for example, if, you know, if you, if there's one word, if when you bring your identification in, there's one word in your name that's off, for example, they've seen that that happens more often with African-American people. For example, African-American people are more likely to have hyphenated names, like all these kinds of small things. Or just if you make someone wait for three or four hours, they're less likely to vote, right? So you say, okay, the Supreme Court says it's okay to have a drop box. We'll have one drop box in, for every county in Texas. So that means one in Houston for all of Houston, right? Like it's not you know, possible. So it's little things like that. But then just the intimidation factors, which are in there with increasingly people open carrying and organizing as militias. So I think the intimidation is, is a huge and real issue. So the only way to justify that intimidation is to create this discourse around voter fraud. By having the chief law enforcement officer, the attorney general of the United States, a new Supreme Court justice and a sitting Supreme Court justice sort of give credence to that, it's, uh, it's very distressing because those are the people who need to be telling us that that's not happening and that obviously um, you know, voter intimidation is, 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 is rampant. And, you know, it's, it's, it's what's bringing the situation close to violence. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think that leads us to maybe like the next question, question, which is, you know, if there is a close election, a marginal election in which Trump is, appears to have won, you know, or appears to have lost, maybe is the more interesting one, you know, mm -hmm. would he accept that election result coming off of the back of, all of this sort of like voter fraud rhetoric, right? You know, he said that he that he won't. Um, you know, I guess like, what do you guys think? Does anyone think that he? Because I think that's kind of one of the most pressing issues when I think about the American election. That when I think about it, it gives me fear, right? I just post this as a question: Is what uh, you know what in like? Why would anybody think that he would? Last election, he didn't even accept the results when he won. He said that he's not going to accept the elections. And I think in general, the way that it winning and losing works in his psyche, it's this kind of either or you, you're a winner or you're a loser. And I just don't think the idea of losing something, even if you can respectably lose something is part of the way in which winning and losing functions in his understanding of the world. Jim, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, yeah, um, I I would say he pro he probably would not want to um, uh, want to like um, admit the defeat if if it if it's the conclusion. But like um, it's it was a recent case uh, in Turkey. Like so, I I kind of like can assess like what would happen if if he wants a re-election and if a re-election would happen in in istanbul when the election happened the um the akp lost with like a really small margin and then erdogan wanted the re-election and they basically he, had, he owned he owns the system so like it, it was said and done like we had a re-election in like a couple months and then the margin became like more than a million votes so like even AK, AKP supporters said, dude, that's, that's enough. Like, just don't be a sore loser, you know? Like, even, even in an authoritative regime, people don't like the sore losers, I guess. And in, probably in the US, like, if there's a real action, people will be like, come on, man. Like, you know, just take the defeat. If they believe it. Yeah, but like, I mean, <laughs> like, I, I don't feel like it's at the at the end it doesn't really question of admitting like or believing in it like at the end it's like just to be you know like don't pushing it that hard like if if that's the result just take the defeat because like it's the honorable thing to do or like at least you know just don't be the crybaby because that doesn't look really good on a leader who is like, just go with the popular popularity and like trying to be authoritative. They, those kind of voters, I think wants to see their leader as not a crybaby, but just like a, you know, like a superior person who uh, when, when he is defeated will actually doesn't really care about it and move on. 
be, because like then it just kind of like um he he would lo lost all that charisma or like all that kind of like profile that he kind of created overall i I don't. I don't feel like even. I. I don't feel Trump would do that. Like at the end, I don't feel if he lose, somebody would tell him to not just want the real action or like just go go with it because then it, I don't feel the the U.S. system would allow it in a really easy way. Then it will be like taking probably taking too much time to prove a reasonable ground to like make a re-election i'm not really sure like laws or like the conditions for that but like i don't i don't feel the advisors of trump would uh, really suggest to go for a re-election kind of argument i don't know what do you guys feel about that like or at least what do you guys know about that i mean like i i almost i don't know about a re-election but i i think the the creating the perception that, you know, that if it's a marginal thing that it's like, well, that there's fraud and that, you know, as Trump, instead of saying I lost, but I'm going to stay in anyway, saying, no, I actually won. I didn't lose. I won. You know what I mean? And, and you you're being told trust. I lost. Yeah. Yeah. You're being told I lost. And if you believe that you're a sucker kind of thing. Right. And we know and so then he doesn't, yeah, you, you, it's kind of a different narrative is almost what I would say is, is never even going down the path of a re-election is what I see more likely and instead just asserting control, essentially. When you brought up Bush versus Gore earlier, Gore essentially gave over the election just for the stability of the system. And yeah. I think that's something that it's unlikely to see from Trump, but also from Trump supporters. And I do wonder, because there's kind of two groups you do hear a lot of about among the Trump supporters, which would be the diehards. But also mm -hmm. the, the the people that voted for Obama twice and then voted for Trump. Yeah. And so the unicorns. You do wonder if if those people are going to say the integrity of the system is more important. But you also have to wonder maybe those people were actually voting for Trump to throw a wrench in that very system. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, one of the things that you see from the Republican Party is the way in which I think they've done this quite effectively is try to kind of create a monopoly on the idea that they are the managers of these institutions and they keep portraying the Democrats as threats to these very things, even though like, I think you see this in the, in the Trump's rhetoric of this is going to be the most corrupt election ever. Um, he kind of says these things are bad and then put, positions himself as the only protector of their stability, even though he's the one undermining them. Yeah. Come on housewives. Don't you going to thank me? for my efforts, to keep you safe. Um, you know, I think just to cut, there's a lot of themes going on there. I mean, I think in terms of the connection about one of the things that came up, I think a bit in what Jem was saying is, I mean, we all know that there, that Trump has cultivated relationships with authoritarian leaders rather than America's typical allies. You know, one of them, of course, who is, uh, who is uh, Erdogan and the, 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 the Turkish government, right? And so one of the things that Donald Trump has cultivated, he's cultivated these relationships of, that are clearly relationships based on admiration of people like Vladimir Putin, you know, people like, uh, um, you know, Xi in China, the list goes on, any kind of authoritarian, and including cultivating other authoritarians, you know, in the West, right? Um, you know, Bolsonaro in Brazil or whatever. And what, 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 but what Trump, I think, again, this is mean, this is outside my expertise, this is just my opinion, but my sense is that he's jealous of these people because he they live in authoritarian countries where they actually have much more control than he does because there's still a degree of visibility which is afforded because of America's sort of radical openness right so he wishes he had those tools at his disposal his fantasy is that he could make that happen he's put some pieces in place which will make that more likely to happen including what's going on with the judiciary so we shouldn't it's not it's not um you're not you know you're not sort of over exaggerating or crying, you know, emergency when there's no emergency. So this is actually what's happening. But he looks at these guys and doesn't understand why an American president typically wouldn't or hasn't done those things. He has a very authoritarian mentality, you know, and he's and again, it does come from like, who's the background of what's the background of a person who becomes president? I mean, when George Bush became president, you know, people said, 
this is a bit of a different flavor because this guy's not coming out of law school. He's coming out of an MBA program. He has a different, he had a bit of a bloodless kind of view of the world. And some people like myself joked around, oh, maybe a law degree should be a prerequisite for, you know, the presidency or the prime ministership or whatever. But of course, that's not true. But the point is, what's his background? So this is a guy who's always been in a business. He's been a grifter. You know, he, he doesn't have the respect for the institutions. He didn't go to Harvard Law School like, you know, Barack Obama, you know, did or, you know, like go to Yale, like John Kerry or whatever, and bathe in the kind of institutions and reverence for the Constitution. That's not, you know, what his background is. So he doesn't understand why he can't just declare himself ruler for life. Right. So he's he doesn't understand what, what that's about. But specifically on the question of how to handle the outcome of the election, I think we should and are right to say Donald Trump is just he's everybody knows, including the people who support him and who are around him, that, that he's a man. He's just a very flawed individual. I mean, basically a, a kind of a fool. Right. I mean, it's clear that even the people closest to him have revealed that. Right. Um so it's actually not just about what Donald Trump thinks or wants, right? So it's invariably going to be the case that whatever happens in the election after the Donald Trump will think he should remain president and that it was illegitimate, right? And and so one of the things that, that Jen was talking about is, is, well, what about the people around him, right? Well, again, one of the alarming things is that all the people around Trump who have been at least mildly willing to push back on him have been let go. And most of the key, um, some of the key positions around the cabinet table, some key positions in the government are simply empty or contain yes man that he's put there because he couldn't actually get somebody he couldn't get them confirmed because they're not qualified so he's surrounded himself by absolute yes man right so i don't have a lot of faith that anybody's going to speak truth to him or try to like dial him back from the edge right so i'm i don't have my faith in that however if the electoral victory is large enough convincing enough vast enough in those swing states okay and there's no evidence of you know significant foreign interference or hacking uh, and all the votes are permitted to be counted uh and he's won in by a large um portion and, and taken you know states like georgia or texas for example it's over and he will have to leave or he'll be taken out and i mean when i when i when i uh wrote i wrote an article of an op-ed about what, what it meant to have Trump a few months back musing about the possibility of not leaving office. And I wrote this, this it was one of the more, it's just because it was an interesting issue. It was one of the things I read that more, more, lots of people read. And I got a few, I had some really interesting people reach out to me who are former military people and tell me that there, there's, that, that once the, that there's no question within the military that once there's agreement on the election that they, the White House means nothing. You can hold himself up in the White House. So they want to turn off the communications, turn off everything in there. You know, the president on Jan, the Constitution is, is very clear on noon on January 20th, 2021, uh, president, a duly elected president will take office. Uh, and, you know, so it's not there again, if it's close, though, and it's a claim of fraud and I won the election and we're going to litigate this and count off and cut off the counting of the ballots before it terminates, which, again, the court has showed that they might be willing to do that. Then all bets are off. Right. So we need. So I think that the, the reason that some of the, you know, the, you know, you remember at the Democratic National Convention, you had Michelle Obama give a very effective speech where she said, go and show up at the polls, don't mail it in or whatever. Right. Because what the thing is, is that that all these covid deniers who are Trump supporters, they're all going to vote in person. And then he'll say, count these ballots and then it's going to be waiting for these other ballots to come in. Will they what's going to happen there? Right. Um, it's not about. Um, uh, and so that's so this these are the real the real issues. So, again, it's not if it's a close election, it's not clear what's going to happen. And, 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 and it could come to the court. There are other scenarios by which it could even go through Congress. It could become extremely explosive, extremely complex. And it could result in the biggest uh, political crisis uh, that you've ever seen or live through it could all be a tempest in a teapot and it could be a huge rollicking election uh win for for um for for joe biden and that's it uh however it is whether the guys you know sort of dragged out or, or what doesn't matter it's over but if it's if it's a little narrower all bets are off um and if you know trump wins narrowly too it raises all kinds of questions obviously so we don't know you know we can't none of us are dumb enough to put bets in these in this situation but you know i was i I, I was, I remember on the night that Donald Trump was elected in 2016 and we were all shocked. Right. And I remember I, I was watching his face, how he looked 
when he, you could tell he just received the news. And to me, he looked absolutely fucking gobsmacked. Like he did not expect to win, right? And like what his move was is, oh, there's a, he wanted to claim there was election fraud and then use this to pivot to start his own Fox media thing. That's like his real dream, right? And so he may still be waylaid into that or whatever, but he also now he's exposed to liability in all kinds of ways. He needs to get elected to avoid all kinds of liability. But when I saw his face that night, I thought this guy, in the end, he'll be a shit president, but he's going to calm down a little bit and be people around him will manage him. And I was wrong. That did not happen. And so I have no, I have no illusions now. This guy gets reelected or thinks he's reelected or it's close. He'll be totally unhinged. He'll use the vast powers of the presidency to hang on for dear life. And he'll have no hesitation to reopen what are very, very um, consequential and unhealed uh, wounds in America's public body, which date back to the Civil War. Maybe I'll invite a little bit of a, a round table for people to participate, which is something I've been thinking about with sort of touching off that, like, I guess, do people feel, I guess, hopeful about the American election? You know, some of our sort of our world calming down a little bit. I think there's everyone I know, I do feel like there's a lot of chaos going on in the world and that kind of thing. And, and is it something that, you know, people look at the American election and they go, you know, if Joe Biden wins by, you know, if he wins by a lot, or if there is even, you know, some sort of contested election thing, like when you're looking into the future, you know, two weeks, six weeks, six months, five years from now, you know, what do you think about that? I guess would be a question I'd put to you guys, um, if that makes sense. Um, anyone have any thoughts on that? I want to kick, kick something of that off. You know, the one thing that I find where there is room for optimism is not so much in electoral politics, but what you do see happening in the streets of the US. And um, like the Sunshine Movement was mentioned earlier, Black Lives Matter. I was listening to something the other day and somebody was talking about how um, their experience in the, the 60s civil rights movement um, has already, their successes have already been vastly outshadowed by the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think that there is, there is hope in people organizing on the streets and making real changes. And the one thing that I, I think is important to, to say about Joe Biden, where I did kind of say, I think there is a lot of similarities between the Democrats and the Republicans in their support for corporations, but Joe Biden would definitely be much more willing to listen to people on the streets than Donald Trump or any Republican really for that matter. And so I do think there is some optimism there. And I think particularly, um, especially if it happens in tandem with a reconfiguration of some of the top-down forms of power, like a reconfiguration of the courts, if better bottom-up structures of power can be developed in not only America, but all around the world, I think that is major reason for hope. Jordan, Jim, any, you guys have any thoughts around that or on I mean, I would, have to, I would have to agree with you. I think on the other hand, though, if Trump does win, I think we're in for a long, like an increase in what we're already seeing now, especially in the States. I think, I think people um, on both sides are going to get even more um, excitatory in, in what they believe in. I think Biden supporters not even Biden supporters. I just think people, um, in terms of Black Lives Matter and all the and all these movements, I think are going to be angry with the results. Um, and I think I think there's going to be even more chaos created in the wake of a uh, Trump win, um, as opposed to a Biden win, like you said. Um, but I but then on the other hand, a Biden win, there's going to be Trump supporters that might get even more chaotic depending on the outcome, if it's a big margin, if it's a small margin, uh, it's really hard to say. I'll open up, open up. I know Gurdeep, we haven't heard from, I don't know if you're sort of in, if you have a microphone or things like that, or Rosina, I know you said you don't have a mic, but you're on the chat there. So if you wanted to- I picture them doing the dishes. They're doing the dishes. Yeah, yeah. I'll just That's invite sure. the floor too, if, you, if either of you folks are are present. If not, that's okay. Go ahead, Jeffrey. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, again, this just brings me back to an interrelated point, and I think it's a good one to make. Is, is So why do we care about America? What is America to us, right? And this is the point, and this is, is exactly what's coming out right now. You know what America is? America's Black Lives Matter. America's the New Green Deal. America's not just Donald Trump, okay? America's not just corporate capitalism. Everybody recognizes that. We see those young people out in the street there, and our heart bleeds, and we wish we were there with them. And we might make some differences in our own country and stand with indigenous people and think about black lives here because of that. And that's all to the good. That's what America's about. So don't engage, don't allow, you know, foolish friends to say, ah, the stupid Americans, we'd never do that. They're foolish. We need the, we, America brings out some of the best in us and, and it can show some of the worst in us. Right. But also, and I have the same thing when my liberal American friends call me, I lived in the America for many years. Right. They call me up and they're like, dude, I'm getting out of here. I'm moving to Canada. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? You're not going to leave Brooklyn and be happy in East Van because Brooklyn's Brooklyn. You're American. That's your country. And they're like, you're right, man. I'm not moving to Canada. You know what I mean? So it's like, we got to strengthen each other in these things. You know, we're not some Shangri-La liberal promised land and American liberals shouldn't have that fantasy about us. And we can also realize it's okay to love America because there's something we love about America that's uh, about, that represents all that's best about you know, youthfulness and progress and everything like that, right? And so I think that's okay. And you know, when I had that thought the most acutely is I thought about John Lewis. Does everybody know who John Lewis is? You know, American congressman is one of the last civil rights icons to recently die, right? I remember I watched John Lewis's, uh, when I, I watched his, his uh, when he, had, he was lying in state and the flag was draped over his casket, right? And he's lying in, you know, in, con in Congress. And I thought to myself, you know what, you know what, the thing that it really is, I don't think that people understand is like, you know, there a man like John Lewis, he, he wanted the flag draped over his coffin when he died. He didn't say that flag is just like the Confederate flag. That's a fucking swastika. That's the same flag that flew over them releasing the dogs on me on the bridge in Selma. But he said, that's my flag too. I'm American. That's, that's not, you don't get to have that. And so that to my mind, John Lewis makes the idea of America, you know, worth fighting for, right and so i think it's really interesting right now that in the in the in the area of culture and visual culture for example how this is expressing itself have you noticed the plethora of different american flags which are emerging around us on the arms of protesters you've got ones with the blue line that represents you know police life matters right you've got the rainbow american flag you've got an african-american iteration of that flag those are exciting things the american flag is does not belong to anybody right and, and But what America's going through right now, which is really exciting, though, is what they couldn't go through at the end of the Civil War, which was to say there's no place for the American flag and the um, Confederate flag. They cannot stand together. They, ne they let them coexist for all these years, and that brought us to where we are now. And so now that's, this reckoning is here, and it might not be what we hope it is. It might not be pleasant. It might not be nice, right? But a lot of African-American people and young people in particular are saying, we have Second Amendment rights. We can carry guns too. And yeah, that could get really explosive. But that is the narrative that America set. That is where we are. Um, and there are all kinds of possible good and bad outcomes. And there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. But, uh, you know, you're right to be engaged and to care about it and to think and to really think about, you know, what are those impacts on our own political culture, like here in Canada, right? Like to what extent is, you know, Trumpism you know, alive and well here. I mean, I, I, in my own neighborhood, I was out the other day, there was a guy in my neighborhood, he had an all lives matter um, uh, sign on his lawn and a liberal provincial lines. I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's what it's about. You know, now, you know, there's no point in pointing our head the other way. That's what it's about, right? We've got our own, we're much more polite and you know, all that, but you know, this is a rural area, Kamloops. I mean, most, I would say that there are many people who admire Trump and who admire his politics around here. So we shouldn't be living in a fantasy and we should make sure that we're being vigilant, you know, in our country. Um, and and I, so I think it's, it's relevant to be thinking about all that. I don't know if that really answers on some of the, some of those points. Um, no, I think, I think that's great. And, and I mean, I almost think that's a great note to sort of start maybe closing that down the discussion a little, like, because I do want to be conscious of, of folks' time because um, we did say it would go to about, you know, 2.30 here. And I know, Jem, you're, you know, many hours ahead of us. Um, so, you know, I don't want to, you know, keep you too late into the night here. Um, He's on a slightly different schedule. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, but I, does anyone sort of have any, I guess, like, you know, closing thoughts? I mean, I'd written originally this closing round table, which was what do people think will be the most sort of influential force 
yeah. coming coming out of this election. I'm I'm happy. Would be happy to sort of do a, maybe a final closing round on that or whatever else you'd like to maybe say. I, well, yeah. and, uh, oh, sorry. No, you go want. for it, Jan. Um, I can add on Professor Meyer's uh, point about like reminding us about what being an American is in terms of mostly in terms of uh, in America. But I want to really stress the being American in terms of being um, being a leader country of the world. Like Americans, uh, I don't know if any one of you are American or like all of you are American. I don't know, but like if you are, um, you guys are actually leading us. Like in a way, you are choosing for us as well. You're not just choosing for three hundred million people. You're just choosing a per president for 8 billion people and you guys are only have the power to determine that so like it's kind of like a in a historical um, point of view it kind of looks like a um, roman roman republic in a way so you guys have to be mindful of that like you're not just choosing for yourself you're choosing much for much more people and for the world essentially because that president will affect a lot and if you change the president then the radical movements around the world or like uh, a, like the radical change might come in a, in a domino effect that you might think that it's impossible but actually an american vote is much more like is weighing more than any other country's vote you know like my vote essentially in turkey casting a vote is not nothing important compared to u.s citizens vote in presidential election so uh, i think we should kind of add that aspect uh, with what professor myers was telling you know just sort of a global aspect yeah, you know, to take you up on that point, I definitely do understand that America is working as a bit of an empire. And I agree with you when you say that they do have a much more powerful vote in the world than a lot of people do. But like, just to reiterate, where I do see a little bit of hope for the future is people organizing in the street. And in that sense, that goes both ways. And you've seen Black Lives Matter protests all over the world, and that sends a signal to the US. And I think one of the ways in which we can really <clears throat> make meaningful changes into the future is by taking to the streets and kind of, as Jeff was mentioning earlier, retaking those ideas of America that we all believe in and all want to see happen in our own lives and kind of reclaim them. And that's something that the, the Republicans have been really, really good at is kind of creating this monopoly on the ideas of liberty, the ideas of freedom. And we got to take those back and we got to say it in a way that we want to have the liberty, we want to have the freedom to participate in power meaningfully, to organize our societies in ways in which we are not limited by the need to go to work for too many hours for too little pay. We're not limited by not being able to find childcare for our kids. We're not limited by not being able to communicate with one another because of diseases that come up that could have been prevented. We're not scared about changing jobs because of a lack of healthcare. We gotta reclaim these ideas and what it means to be a free person in the world and we got to take those back. And I think the way to do that is by taking to the streets and doing that together all throughout the world. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I really like that idea of, you know, around retaking words like freedom, for example, right? Um, yeah, and I mean, I think touching on that, like I think I'm, I think will be sort of influential, I guess, maybe into the future is maybe, which is maybe hopeful also is like further re-engagement in, in politics. I think for a lot of the 2000s, you know, there was this general narrative about declining interest and engagement amongst amongst all people. People talked about with young people particularly, but I think amongst all people and saying, you know, less people are voting, less people are engaging in issues and just sort of being happy with the status quo. And I think with sort of all of the chaos happening in the world, particularly what's emanating out, emanating out of the United States is I, I just don't think that'll be possible anymore. And I think to your point, Joe, we will see more people you know, being out on the streets and getting directly engaged in, in the things that they really care about, which, which I think, I mean, I, I can be really hopeful. I think it can also be really, you know, kind of terrifying too, in terms of some of the other sort of, you know, further right-wing people that are 
heavily armed and, and things like that. But, but I do think generally an influential force will be people further engaging sort of in, in the political system and things like that. Democracy is terrifying, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. And the point of it, like we're doing democracy right now by sitting together and talking. And I think by getting people more engaged, part of that is by making that recognition that it's engaging with people you agree with, engaging with people you don't agree with, but ultimately engaging and that democracy is not limited to just standing for eight hours in a line to vote once every four years or however long. And I think once people really start to make that change of what it means to be a free person participating in power is having conversations, having scary conversations with people you agree with and disagree with, but actually doing that day to day and not just once in a blue moon. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Jordan, yeah, Jordan like anything that. you want yeah. to contribute as well? And I guess in closing here. Um, not in particular. I agree with everything that you guys have been mentioning. Um, I think one of the most influential forces coming out of the election will be young radical people who are engaged, who are, you know, whether, whatever, whatever they're for, I think, um, there, it's going to be an influential force coming out of it, especially, um, people who are supporting these big movements worldwide, I think, um, they're going to be, I mean, they are the future there. We are the change. Um, and I think, you know, on social media, everything going on right now, um, you see it on the daily, you see people from their perspective in, down, in the streets, you see them, you know, trying to make change. So I think just on that closing round table, you were talking about leap. I think that would be the most influential force coming out of this. And I think that has, to, that connects a lot to what you were saying, Joe and leap as well. I guess the only thing I would just add to that is I thank you for your comments. I think um, Jam and Joe in particular, I mean, what I think you say about empire is true. Of course, America is the is the leading power in our contemporary form of empire. And it's been undergirded the kind of global um, power arrangements, you know, since at least the end of the Cold War. And in that sense, why is it, again, back to our question, why does this matter? Because in empire, we are all Americans, right? Um, so that's kind of what Jem is on about, particularly those of us who have a kind of liberal idea of human rights and equality and everything like that, right? So, and, 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 and so right now, it, it's like we're at the most pivotal moment in the Roman Empire, and we're talking of this conversation in Macedonia. Nobody in Rome is thinking about us, but we're sitting there right looking at it, right? So I think that's true. I think uh, the other piece, the only one, and the other wild card piece in this I just want to sort of have in mind is you know, I don't think that the U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies that have unanimously said there was foreign interference in the last election who said that it's happening again are wrong. And we don't know what the impact of that going to be now because Donald Trump has fired everybody objective and put his own hand picked hacks in the room. Some of what we're hearing about foreign interference in this election is suspect. OK, some of it doesn't sound quite right. Um, you know, particularly like the Iranians getting in there and telling people that, you know, the Proud Boys want them to vote or whatever. Like some of it sounds a bit off, but the, we know, but the, 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 if you read the Mueller report, the first book chapter of the Mueller, the first book of the Mueller report, part one, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very exhaustive explanation of how foreign powers work with malign interests here to interfere in the election. They didn't get into the electoral system itself, but there've been attempts, okay? They've been foiled, but we don't know what's gonna happen in the end. But also that manipulation on, that goes on on social media, that's a wild card. I don't know how that's gonna affect the outcome here. So everything we say is subject to, the, to that wild card. The other takeaway in terms of what can we do, how can we take, and I agree, you take it to the streets, right? Even where there's a risk of violence, you must go to the streets to preserve democracy if either, if, if, if elections aren't working, right? Um, so I think it's right that, you know, we, that Americans go to the streets and that we go to the streets and that you try to keep it peaceful, but you can't fear doing that. The other piece of it I'll tell you is, is this, this is one thing you can do in your everyday life, I think, and in, in, in maybe in, in our own way, we can make a difference around this, is don't concede certain things, right? Don't concede that every argument has two valid sides. Don't believe in, both sides it doesn't exist on every other issue. There's no debate about climate change. There's no debate about authoritarianism. These are things that are happening, right? Um, and don't fall into and don't allow people to 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 prevent you from honestly uh, articulating your politics by telling you, well, the problem is we have too many radicals on the left and too many radicals on the right. That's a false equivalency. Radical leftists 
They want human rights. They want human decency. They want equality of the genders and, and they want um, racial reconciliation and environmental justice. They're not extremists. They're humanitarians. The extreme right has a fascist agenda. There is no equivalence. They don't meet up. There's no u horn and there's a right and wrong. Of course, there's many things we can disagree on. There's many gradations of policy that we could argue with, but don't fall into the false belief that if you're not a centrist who views everything as having two sides, that you're not, you're, 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 you know, you're part of the problem. You're not part of the problem. You speak frankly, and it's okay to have views that are labeled as radically left because those views are humanist views. And you're young people and you should absolutely have them. And uh, the views on the radical right are obnoxious. And it's not always possible to engage with people in, in a meaningful debate. It doesn't mean you go to violence, but you try to convince those in the middle, right? And so, and I know that all of you are doing that, I'm sure in your real life. So the only thing I'll say to you at the end of this is if you want, I'm happy to come back together after the election, maybe a month after the election or whatever, to sort of revisit and take up our conversation again. If you want to do that, I, I can definitely make myself available to you for that. Awesome. Yeah. No, I'll definitely think about that because I think that could be really a cool conversation. It's like sort of a, a post-election thing. And and uh, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Anyone yeah. else have any closing thoughts or anything before we sort of end the call here, I guess? I just want to say that another conversation would be great. More of this stuff is exactly what we got to be doing. So thanks for putting it on, Leaf. And thanks for coming, Jeff. And Jem and oh, yeah. everybody that was here. Cheers. Thanks. Really appreciate it.